all right thank you so much for being here good morning to you all and uh, this is sas talks number 4 um and it's also designed as brain trust number 1 and we have an exemplary guest today uh someone who's been in who's kind of the i would say a patriarch in a lot of ways to the sustainability uh space in india <laughs> and uh and we are super excited to have you the format will be uh it'll be about 15 and 20 minutes of you speaking to us on the core themes that you have uh, picked and then for uh, following that we'll just do Q&A and really open it up to our uh, members everybody you see on on the call today is uh, a member in the mafia the two or three names i don't recognize but we can come to them later okay arjun i'll hand it over to you to introduce mr dhawan and how you know him thanks ani uh, i think from the last 5 minutes uh, <laughs> we can see that mr dhawan doesn't need much of an introduction to this crowd uh, everybody knows uh, who mr dhawan is but what i'd like to mention especially you know mr dhawan uh, was the md of oracle in india before shakti so you know i think the one of the things that the mafia is is trying to do is uh you know change the conversation and put sustainability at the forefront of business leaders mindsets and uh, you know really get them to see that this is a business imperative and that line actually comes from uh, mr dhawan uh so you know having been the md of such a large company and then transitioning into a career that supports sustainability solutions around a decade ago uh you know i think he has gone through that personal journey of being uh, you know a head of a multinational and into sustainability and supporting so many organizations like ours and uh, you know he has those really interesting insights and perspectives having gone through that journey so uh, we really look forward to learning from him on how other big, big business leaders can make a similar journey maybe not all the way to sustainability and 100% focus but at least work it into the core of their businesses so i'm super excited about this talk and i don't want to take more time so i'm going to turn it over to mr dhawan how i met him was just through i was one of the beneficiaries of shakti sustainable energy foundations as work uh, first I, as a consumer of the very high quality research reports that come out of shakti and the participant in a number of initiatives with respect to cooling so shakti helped to start this sustainable and smart space cooling coalition brought some of the leading foundations from across the world uh, oak foundation climate works and so I mean, macarthur foundation hewlett foundation packard foundation so many of them around the world to really understand that uh, you know cooling is a very important topic for india and shakti was the one i think who kicked off that conversation and today we see all these foundations getting into it in a big way and really uh, you know saying uh, committing dollars over next few years uh, to really fo focusing on that challenge and even the government of india has come out with a national cooling action plan so i think you know the work around cooling the first high profile supporters uh, were mr krishan dhawan and shakti and we see that today the industry is really hot <laughs> the cooling industry has become hot so i am personal beneficiary of that work and you know our, our company's work is supported uh, very heavily through that so i'd like to thank him again in a public forum for kicking that work off and uh, excited to see what he has to uh, say to us today so over to you mr dhawan thanks for being with us today okay thank you arjun and ani uh, for your kind words of welcome and introduction and it's uh, indeed a pleasure to be here with you all this morning i think uh, the sustainability mafia is an outstanding idea and an outstanding initiative and 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 very much needed and i'm i'm very encouraged with the enthusiasm shown by the the core group and uh, the ability that they've been able to enlist uh, so many like-minded uh, people i think we obviously have a long ways to go but i think this is an outstanding start so um for my conversation today obviously it's 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 a very nice and comfortable feeling to be speaking to the quote and quote converted so i don't feel i'll have to convert anybody to a particular uh kind of thinking uh because this is a self selected group of individuals who who you know firmly believe in sustainability and actually have made 
uh, chosen to make their living in some way or fashion around uh, sustainability as, as a concept. Uh, often uh, when people discuss sustainability, they discuss the issues of morals and ethics and doing the right thing. And that's absolutely okay. And that's you know what motivates me and brought me into this space in the first place. However, what, I was, what I'm gonna try to do in terms of positioning uh, that uh, today's conversation is take that for granted uh, and, uh, and, and try to make the case that if we are to spread uh, this, this, this belief uh, and, and value system, we need to uh, talk about business and business imperatives and not rely on somebody's moral uh, or ethical sort of construct. But since we're talking about business and uh, this, many of you are actually uh, in business, and your clients are going to, are people in business. The, the value proposition for your enterprises and what you offer to other enterprises has to be rooted very firmly in, um, in, in, in business terms uh, rather than in uh, sort of uh, conceptually moral and ethical terms. So, you know, we're gonna not uh, appeal to people's noble traits in this conversation, but your more basic traits, which are uh, fear and greed which I think drive a lot of uh, human, uh, human activity. Um, and I think uh, those are very powerful uh, instincts in, in human beings, uh, fear of, of the unknown or fear of something bad happening and greed for uh, something better, um, which in business terms, uh, we can just uh, use a slightly more palatable expressions of looking at risks and opportunities. So, so essentially we will be discussing that because it's only if business people can understand the opportunity and the risk in business terms will we get true buy-in and you know make this concept stick and not rely on somebody's uh, particular point of view on on the the necessity for for sustainability from a from a subjective point of view so we want to make this really you know hardwired and they make it understood and integral to, 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 to business decisions, etc. Now sustainability uh, obviously uh, covers a wide swath of issues and I think the membership of the, the group covers that. That includes water, waste, uh, you know, resource efficiency, uh, energy, climate. Um, my background and bias coming from Shakti is largely on the climate and uh, energy side. So most of my arguments will be made uh, using references to that space. But I think uh, those, those discussions and arguments can easily be extended to uh, other forms of sustainability, which are equally important. It's just that I, have, I didn't have the ability to work in that space, you know, like water and waste and resources. Uh, so I don't want to limit the, the, the conversation anyway, but just wanted to put into context, uh, you know, where I'm, I'm going to be uh, coming from in, in terms of my, my commentary. And, and um, I think in my early conversation with, uh, with Ani, before we had this, we, we sort of, in our conversation, we came uh, upon uh, a concept which many of you may know or may not, but I'll just take a few minutes to discuss which is the concept of a keystone habit. Um, and a keystone habit is sort of a foundational habit. And this is uh, quoted uh, in a book by Charles Duhigg on uh, I think a fairly well sold and well read book called The Power of Habit, um, uh, where um, he talks about in many cases adopting uh, one particular habit tends to unlock and unleash patterns of, of positive behavior that may not be directly related to that habit. So that's what he defines as a keystone habit. And the example he gives is an interesting one. It's uh, from the, the, the world of business. Uh, back in uh, 1987, uh, Alcoa, which was at that time one of the world's largest aluminum companies, got a new chief executive called Paul O'Neill. And the company was not doing very well financially. Uh, they had uh, you know, troubles in, in, in several departments and much was expected of this new CEO. And at his first press conference with analysts and journalists, 
they expected him to uh, come out with this sort of very business oriented um, plan as often CEOs do, new CEOs do in terms of what he was going to do. And he actually surprised everybody by saying that his number one priority in Alcoa is going to be increasing the safety standards in this manufacturing company. And that actually surprised and shocked lots of people and left them quite disappointed because they were expecting you know, much more strategic jargon in terms of uh, ROI, new businesses, uh, you know, synergies, uh, this and that. And um, they left the conversation very confused. However, Paul O'Neill stuck to his guns and Alcoa, which had a sort of indifferent record of uh, employee safety, decided to make employee safety, which is important in any situation, especially uh, a manufacturing situation where you're dealing with metals and ores at very high temperatures, a, a key focus in the company. And he enlisted, he made it his job to enlist everybody in making this change. And he succeeded. And over a number of months, um, the safety standards and the safety ratios at uh, Alcoa started to improve uh, and, and became industry leaders and became really very good to a point where it was truly, um, uh, you know, it was uh, setting standards in this space. The interesting thing that happened along with this is that Alcoa's profit started to improve. And their performance in parameters across the board uh, in performance parameters started to improve to the point where they fairly soon hit record profits. And when Paul O'Neill left uh, 13 years later, the profitability had gone up five, fivefold. So I, I think that's a, it's a very powerful sort of a concept that one can you know, apply and one should try applying in, in the world of, of sustainability. Because I think sustainable business habits will unlock a lot of benefits. So I think sustainability is good in itself. There's no question about that. But sustainability also generates a lot of, 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 of positive behavior and positive attributes. And those of you, uh, especially from the investment community who are familiar with the concept of investing being called ESG, I think uh, ESG investors recognize that, that uh, not only with a company focusing on ESG be more resilient and more competitive, but good habits in, in this domain will, will spill over into making this a better and a more efficient uh, company. Um, I give a small example of uh, U.S. mortgage lenders um, who, if you go to take a, a mortgage loan and they see and you certify that you have invested in energy efficiency uh, investments around your house, uh, you know, cooling, heating, renewable energy, what have you, they give you a break on uh, the, the interest rate. Uh, and why is that? Because ostensibly, you know, between financial risk uh, of, of a mortgage payment and uh, the energy efficiency of the home, there shouldn't be uh, an obvious relationship. But they have found that people who take the trouble of being energy mindful are also better credit risk. So that's sort of, you know, it's a, it's a gateway habit. I mean, you hear of gateway drugs, this is, you know, a gateway habit. And uh, I think Ani was giving me his personal example that he took the trouble of uh, um, deploying solar panels at his house. And once he did that, he suddenly has become so much aware of everything else uh, associated with sustainability in his personal life, uh, like water, et cetera. So I think uh, in terms of, just as a concept for all of you, I think uh, when I think of sustainability, I think I come away with this uh, strong identification with a, a, a keystone habit. I think it's, it's something you may want to, uh, you, you probably have it, maybe you haven't thought of it in those terms, but it's something you may want to uh, build upon uh, both amongst yourselves and your own company uh, and extend it, like I said, beyond just uh, you know uh, sustainability issues to, to every aspect of, of of your life, and hopefully convince your clients and your customers uh, and your suppliers, uh, all of the more important in your value chain, to to, to to do so. So, 
that's just uh, sort of an opening uh, setting that I wanted to give to the conversation. So this is uh, the World Economic Forum comes out with an annual assessment of risks in, the, in January of, of the year. We've been doing this for, for many years, for 15 odd years. And this is the January 2020 uh, report. Uh, what I've done is shown you uh, data on 2008, 2014, and 2020. So going back six and, and, and 12 years. Um, and these uh, list the top five likely risk seen by 800 respondents that the WAF has checked with among its membership, which comprises of you know, senior uh, business and uh, uh, government leaders around the world. And there's two buckets, as you can see. One is, you know, what is the likelihood of something happening, in your opinion? And two, if that happens, you know, which is the ones that will have the greatest impact if they do happen? So the box on the left is the likelihood uh, table. And what's interesting is how things have changed over the last uh, 12 odd years. And what is quite dramatic is that in 2020, every risk identified is in the green bucket, which is the environmental bucket. And the line at the bottom just shows you the five categories that WAF uses. So today, if you ask senior business leaders, what are the five most likely risks to your business? All five come from the broad world of the environment, which is extreme weather, of uh, failure uh, on climate action, natural disasters, biodiversity loss, and environmental. And when they say environmental disasters, I mean man-made environmental disasters in the last box rather than natural disasters. And uh, in uh, 2008, there was not a single environmental one, and you could start seeing in, uh, in 2014 some, some presence of it. But this is how skewed uh, realization is today about how you know, our lives and our livelihoods are at, at risk and from what sources. And if we move to the impact column uh, table and columns, there again in 2008, there was no um, environmental issues, but in, by 2020, three out of five are considered environmental and the fourth is water and, you know, they call it societal but I, I, I see strong connectivity with the environment and uh, sustainability. And there's one sort of geopolitical, which is weapons of mass destruction. So clearly, uh, you know, this is, you know, not a niche opinion. It's not a narrowly held opinion. This is a very broadly held opinion. And, uh, you know, it, it, it surprises me when uh, people who represent, say, potentially your customers, the large corporations, uh, don't, uh, exhibit behavior that reflects this, this, this recognition or this realization. Uh, interestingly enough, in 2008, pandemics is at the bottom, is number five. I think when we do this exercise again, if we did it today, I think pandemics would certainly make its appearance. But uh, by January, when this survey was taken, uh, I don't think we'd fully understood the, 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 the impact and the damage of, of the pandemic. So India, and this is a global survey, India is, I think, all the more exposed. Um, and most people agree that India's risk to climate change and uh, change in the environment is much more acute than the average around the world. Uh, among the issues we can expect to see at the current trajectory is heat stress, extreme heat, heat stress, especially in the Gangetic Plain in, in, in the Deccan. And the expectations are that uh, temperatures are going to reach almost unsustainable le levels in, in the summer months, which will make um, certainly any work that's outdoors very difficult um, and, and create uh, other related problems. Um, the, uh, the timing and the amount of rain is also changing. And uh, the timing of the rain is as important as the, as the amount of rain, uh, because if rain comes at, at the wrong time, it can be disastrous for, for farmers. And, you know, we must still remember that a lot of our country is rural, uh, a lot of our population is rural, and they're dependent on uh, natural rainfall and uh, water from rivers uh, for, for, for irrigation, et cetera. 
So uh, a, a bad rain or a mistimed rain or no rain in a, in a drought is, is devastating. Uh, the other source of, of rain uh, water is the snow melt, uh, the glaciers in the Himalayas, and that they too are in retreat. And over time, you know, the, the flow into the rivers of North India will, will get impacted. And uh, we're seeing rise in sea levels and uh, more cyclonic activity, extreme activity. So um, in, you know, all, all corners of, of, of the country virtually, uh, India is going to be more and more impacted. Uh, by, by uh, changes in climate. And once again, if one is not thinking about it, I think one is not doing one's job uh, as, as, a, as a business person. So, um, you know, don't, you know, this isn't meant to be a conversation of doom and gloom, but one of sort of reality. And uh, I think it's important that we sort of, sort of set the stage. So we'll move into the next uh, slide, please, Ani, which is just Know, uh, a listing of risks. I'm sure you all, you all know these things. Um, you know, we can. Uh, I won't discuss them in, in great detail here. There's, you know, changes in regulation and in policy that can, you know, surprise you or, or put you at a, at a disadvantage. Markets can change and can evolve away from from your products. Your supply chain can be impacted uh, by, by by climate changes. Technologies can change, uh, you know, uh, rendering your businesses uh, obsolete. Uh, there's obviously a physical assets, uh, a physical risk of climate change from floods, uh, from cyclones, tsunamis, uh, what have you, uh, that can physically damage, uh, you know, your manufacturing or your distribution facilities. And I think a really important one uh, we could spend, you know, an hour or, or more discussing is access to finance. I think, especially for larger companies, and especially in, in the developed world, uh, more and more uh, financiers are beginning to ask questions uh, of their customers, be as investors or as lenders. Um, you know, they, they do not want to be associated with uh, takers of capital that are uh, polluting the environment, creating uh, you know, degrading the environment and creating a more uh, climate, uh, adverse climate change. And certain industries uh, that were on a sort of negative screen for, for many investors like arms, tobacco, alcohol, um, certain new industries based on their carbon emissions, uh, like coal, are, are, are joining this. And uh, I sort of briefly alluded to ESG, that's increasingly being used as a yardstick by, by investors and lenders to decide. So if you're on the wrong side of this filter, uh, especially if you're a large company, uh, dependent on more formal market capital, et cetera, uh, you, know, you, won't, you won't get much access. Okay, moving on to the next slide, please, Ani. So there is, obviously a strong business case for sustainability, otherwise all of you wouldn't be in that space. But here I just want to pause is that, you know, make an important, I think an important observation that often when we discuss climate change and adjusting and adapting and mitigating climate change, the focus is on the costs. And people are, you know, always moaning about the huge cost that this change will necessitate. And, um, Somebody in an article I just read said to meet SDGs will be the world will need to spend three trillion dollars for the next ten years per year, thirty trillion. Where is that going to come from, and you know who's going to bear that cost? But for me, anybody, one person's cost is another person's revenue. So you know it isn't just you know it's there's sort of a double entry to this uh, this equation. You know it isn't just a cost in a vacuum. So if somebody's going to spend or need to spend more money, uh, be it on water filtration or drip irrigation or solar panels or electric cars or better batteries or, or windmills or more sustainable building materials or more efficient waste management systems or air filtration systems, yes, it is the cost for, for, for the person who has to do it. But in equal amounts, it's, it's, it's a source of revenue for anybody providing that product or that service. 
So I think uh, for those of you in the sustainability business, um, you know, obviously the amounts we're talking about have to be achievable. But every time somebody says something has to be spent and, 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 and talks about the, the, the burden of that, I mean, I think, you know, those in the business should be lining up and say, hey, let us help you with that burden. We, we're going to help you meet, you know, we, uh, you know, meet your need. We, we have a product or we have a service that, you know, caters or will cater to exactly you know, what is it you need. So, you know, the business cases are, again, sort of self-evident. Uh, you know, we're talking about improving resource efficiency. Uh, you know, any form of efficiency flows straight to the bottom line. It, it adds to, to the net profit if you use less product to make a certain amount of output. You know, it, 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 you need to, you know, we don't, many companies don't work in a vacuum. You know, there's a supply chain. You may be part of a supply chain or you may have a supply chain. So there's an opportunity to, to strengthen that. Uh, I think getting ahead of policies is a very important one. Uh, I think policy, uh, you know, folks at Shakti and at C-Step, you know, that's the area we, we work on. And the idea is to try to work on positive policy. Uh, but, you know, there's all too often, uh, and it surprises me how often, uh, companies get quite surprised. Uh, either they, firstly, they don't support uh, positive policy. Uh, they, they're all for the status quo. They're all for defending uh, their existing investment. They're not for, for moving ahead. Uh, and then when policy comes, they act so surprised and, you know, they, they complain, they lobby, they go to the courts, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, a great example is the automobile industry. You know, for years, the, the uh, trajectory has been clear. We need to move and upgrade uh, the efficiency of the engines and, the, and the, the improve the quality of the fuels we use. And this has been a, a long articulated policy. We call these Bharat uh, standards. These are based on the Euro standards. And in the last few years, we've actually made great headway moving from two to three to four and, and jumping over five to six. But it, it's quite amazing. I remember when we moved from three to four, while there were some progressive manufacturers who had started tooling up and uh, reading their inventory a year in advance, there were some who actually, until the very last day, were ramping up uh, production. And, and then they complained, oh, we're, we're stuck with unsold, you know, unsaleable stocks. So I think there's a lot that can be done there. Now, stakeholder pressure is, is, is a large expression, and this can cover pressure from your financiers. Uh, if you're part of a supply chain, it can cover pressure from your, your buyers. I think uh, uh, I'll take an example uh, in, um, say, the, the garment industry. Um, where initially, you know, people were just focused on supplying the right product at the right price. But many years ago, the issue of labor standards came in. Uh, and, uh, you know, labor inspectors started visiting uh, Indian garment manufacturers to make sure labor conditions were met a standard that these buyers had set for themselves, uh, especially in terms of child labor, etc. And if you fail to meet that cut, you know, you, you didn't get uh, the business irrespective of your price. And, uh, you know, that's now happening with sustainability. Uh, companies in the past would get embarrassed by poor labor practices. Today, they don't want to get embarrassed. And, and hopefully more than, it's not just about embarrassment, it's about their belief system by somebody who they're buying from, say in India, who is polluting the rivers, who's polluting the air. Uh, so, you know, you would get this sort of uh, pressure. If you don't meet that cut, you will not get that business. Um, employees over time, uh, young millennials won't join companies. Uh, uh, you know, so just like many people won't join a tobacco company, uh, after some time, people may not wanting to join, you know, a coal company or, or a company that has a bad track record uh, of, 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 of pollution, and, you know, and so on and so forth. So the stakeholders are, and this is linked to reputation, are, are uh, you know, our policy makers, are your, are your capital providers, are your customers, are your suppliers, and are your, are your employees. And I think one of the most important and interesting ones for in, investing in sustainability is that it enables you to foster innovation and goes into, into new markets and new products. And I think that's the most exciting part. Uh, you know, doing things uh, either for the first time or doing things in a way not being done before and just actually creating markets that didn't, that didn't exist. Um, you know, it's, 
it's no it's no uh, coincidence that say in the electric car market uh, you have an Elon Musk you know who's not an automobile guy who's you know on his way to creating what is almost the most valuable automobile company in the world today you know this you wouldn't have got General Motors to do to do this so you know this there is opportunity for disruption it's only the disruptors who will uh, who will um, you know be able to reap this 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 great this great opportunity so you know this is an opportunity for resilience of your business but it's a opportunity for competitive advantage for your business um and uh, and you know both both are are, are are very compelling um so you know one has to move from just being you know compliant to being engaged and then hopefully becoming a leader in sustainability, and uh, the the, comp the compliant folks are going to be dragged along and and won't be ready. Uh, the engaged folks will be a bit more there, but the leaders are going to set the pace and you know be setting uh, the terms of the market terms, you know, and being able to influence policy rather than being victims victims to policy. They'll be able to influence policy and be ready for for change. So that really uh, you know brings me to an end to you know what the i think are the obvious issues i'll just close with what i see as 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 as, as a need uh and uh, i think in the sas mafia uh template they have um a slide uh, for what i'd like to see in 2030 so you know maybe you can take this as uh, as that and you know hopefully we don't have to wait till 2030 but the need, I believe, is to make sustainability a key organization process. It has to be integrated into every decision. It is not something you appoint a chief sustainability officer for who attends a lot of seminars and, and, and creates you know, a lot of PR, uh, while the uh, unit head, the manufacturing head, the marketing head, the design head, and the CFO end up doing their own thing. So I think it has to be really ingrained and inbuilt and there has to be a congruence between the sustainability uh, agenda and the missions, the values, uh, and the goals of the company. And, and you know that's that's the end state where where it has to be. Um, and you you have to keep sustainability in mind when you're deciding capital allocations, when you're deciding product design, and when you're doing performance planning. I don't know how many companies there are today that actually evaluate their senior executives on this parameter. And as any of you uh, who have worked in large organizations with formal ev uh, evaluation systems, you know, if you're not being evaluated on something, you, don't, you just don't pay attention to it. You know, it's just uh, something you, know, you pay lip service to and, and, and you move on. And one of the most powerful concepts, I believe, that will drive this, and this is you know, more a carbon one, is the, cost of, is the concept called cost of or carbon pricing, or cost of carbon. In no organization, formal organization today, is a finance, any investment decision taken without factoring the cost of capital and the ROI. I think that's just inbuilt. Uh, you know, when you're evaluating two projects that are a, a similar size or they come up at a similar time, you, you, you pick and choose by uh, seeing, you know, is the capital available? What's the capital and what's the return? And where do you get the better return? And, and then you, that's how you do it. And that's how you're evaluated at the end of the evaluation period. What sort of return? Uh, the head office gave the unit had a, a bunch of capital. What sort of return have you generated? I really believe we have to do that for carbon, the cost of carbon. So if you're a company looking at two projects, uh, you have to factor in a price of carbon, and that's a whole subject for discussion, but any price, let's just take a price. And then you have to evaluate both those uh, uh, options based on what is the return that you're getting if you put a price of carbon on that. And then you should be going for the one with a lower carbon budget and with a higher return. And the evaluation process should be the same. So I think if we can treat uh, carbon like like capital in terms of pricing in terms of allocation in terms of return i think we would have uh, gone a long way in integrating uh, you know, sustainability into the uh, into the business process rather than uh, just talk you know doing an annual report and having a cso who makes a, a lot of presentations out to the market 
um, you know, the CEO should be the CSO. Everybody should be the chief sustainability officer. You shouldn't have a chief officer. It should be inbuilt into everything. So with that, I think I may have spoken more than I should, but I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dhawan. Uh, especially for starting off with that great Alcoa example of Keystone Habit and ending with uh, your vision for the future, which is totally in line with ours as well. Like carbon needs to have a price. Uh, and it needs to be taken more seriously on balance sheets, on household budgets, uh, you know, we'll have to do a lot of design around that. 